Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Hong Kong U on what is uh, not necessarily the nicest spring morning in, in Hong Kong. Um, today, we've got a, a pretty full program. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing, big picture dynamics. Uh, Henry Arcelanian uh, from PwC and the Hong Kong FinTech Association is going to talk a little bit about AI in finance. And then we're going to move into uh, a very exciting panel, bringing together uh, a number of, of experts from around the world. Uh, Huy Nian Tru from CFTE, uh, Ursula McCormick uh, from KWM uh, here in Hong Kong, Brian Tang uh, from ACMI, as well as uh, the University of Hong Kong, Janos Barberis from Supercharger. Uh, and I think after that, we'll have a few announcements, uh, some from Hong Kong U, some from CFTE, uh, and a little bit about some of the new courses that we're all bringing out. So I think we'll have, as we go through, people will be wandering in uh, across the day. And uh, to the extent that we're keeping you here over lunch, you'll find just after we wrap up the program that on the first floor just outside, uh, there'll be a light lunch reception that is open to everyone. And for those of you who have some time uh, to stay around and talk, that'll all offer us an opportunity uh, to meet many of you and to hear about your experiences with the different courses as well as what we talk about today. My name is Douglas Arner and uh, I'm a professor here at the University of Hong Kong. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the big picture things that we're seeing. And I think if we look at the big picture, the environment in which we're talking about these questions of fintech and AI, the big picture is that over the past several decades, we have seen a long-term digital transformation of finance everywhere in the world, of developed markets, an explosion over the past 10 years uh, in startups and new entrants, which I think is very, very exciting in developed countries and mo in developing countries, I'm sorry, and most recently a move by big tech and other traditional large platform firms into finance, the idea of tech fin. And for me, in many ways, the most exciting idea is what we're seeing in developing countries. And it's often the case that it's highlighted that today, approximately 1.7 billion people still do not have access to financial services. But for me, what is more exciting in many ways is that since 2010, 1.3 billion people have gotten access to financial services for the first time, mainly in developing countries and mainly as a result of technology. And in fact, over the past 10 years, four countries have accounted for the majority of that 1.3 billion people. Kenya, West Africa with M-Pesa. China, the most rapid and comprehensive digital financial transformation that has taken place in the history of the world. Russia, a very big transformation. And finally, India an incredibly rapid digital financial transformation that is taking place. And what we see is that looking at these experiences, increasingly countries are looking for <laughs> strategies to pursue. And these are relevant not only in developing countries, but even in developed markets like Hong Kong. Increasingly, those strategies center around digital ID systems, particularly biometric systems interoperable digital payment systems, particularly switching structures to allow payments to go from any different form to another, scaling, digitization of government payments and procurement in particular, and finally building new infrastructure for systems, stock markets, credit registries, secured transactions, and the like. And I think when we look at that 1.7 billion, in many ways the most exciting potential is that 70% of that 1.7 billion have a smartphone or a mobile phone. 
And what that means is we have the potential in a very short period of years to bridge a big piece of that gap. And what that really highlights is that today, from a policy standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, some of the biggest issues are around data and finance. And in particular, the interaction of financial regulation with data regulation. And it is in many ways the way that the interaction of data and finance plays out that will be the future direction of our societies. Think about where this process has taken place most comprehensively. Mainland China, Tencent, Alibaba, Alipay, WeChat Pay, the growth of this ecosystem. And we are now seeing similar things. Of course, Facebook with WhatsApp Pay, waiting for regulatory approval to probably roll out a payment system to approximately 450 million people in a very short period of time. And I think this highlights what is increasingly a big challenge. And it's something that in developed markets we've seen a lot of challenges around over the past couple of years. And what we call the 2018 EU Big Bang 2. Dealing with MIFID 2, GDPR, PSD 2, and the interactions of these three different pieces. And I think Going forward, this is a trend that we're seeing around the world. Societies working first on financial regulatory frameworks and the role of regtech within those frameworks. Second, looking at national approaches to data. And I think socially and culturally, we're seeing very different approaches emerge. And finally, questions around the interaction of those two. And I think with that, I'd like to welcome, for our next topic, our first speaker, Henry Arcelani. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. you Excellent, you Douglas. Thank you very much. Excellent, guys. Super, super excited to be here. As Douglas mentioned before, my name is Henry Arcelani, and really my passion, my focus in life is the future of the financial service industry. And I do this at PwC where I had our fintech and crypto practice in Asia. As a fintech association, where I'm the chairman, but most importantly, as an adjunct associate professor here at the University of Hong Kong, where for the last five years I've been teaching a, a fintech course in the MBA program. So very, very excited to be here. My goal over the next five minutes <coughs> is to really share with you guys some practical color of what we are seeing right now with financial institutions as they're experimenting with AI, some of the challenges, and maybe you mention an example of how they try to deal with AI, and hopefully this will lead to the real panel of experts when we and the others will bring in after the soul. You guys excited? Yeah. Excellent. So before I just to kick it off, financial institutions have been trying to deal with AI over the last two, three years. In practice, in many cases, it's been a massive failure. Many banks have been trying innovation labs, most of them are closing it down. A lot of people were dealing with this, they didn't have the budget, they didn't have the authority, the management buy-in. In many cases, it looked good for CEO speeches, it looked good when the students came to visit. In practice, very little has been done. And there's many reasons for this, actually, when you look at it. One of the main reasons is actually, despite all their goodwill, it was a spaghetti of the bank. That even, um, I realize I don't have a mic. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I have a pretty uh, loud voice. My wife can tell all about it. <laughs> um, so actually, the, 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 well, one of the big reasons was the spaghetti of the bank. The whole set of legacy infrastructure that the bank had to deal with in the back end. However, that being said, I'll give one example, COBOL. Every time you guys go to use an ATM, 95% of ATM transactions today are based on a coding language that was developed in the 50s and 60s. Today, over 90% of Devla COBOL developers are over the age of 35. Just to put things in perspective, less than 10% of developers in large tech firms are over 35 years old. And what's happening really when you look at this, we have had many problems. Think about money laundering. You know, today money laundering, I, as a, I'm a lawyer by background, I'm shocked at how money laundering still happens today. We're over to have about two trillion, uh, from all the money laundering money we spend around the world, we're still able to capture less than 2% of laundered transactions according to the UI. This means all the systems we're putting in place, all the controls, all the frameworks in practice are failing. If somebody was in charge of this globally, they would be fired, right? So, and then also the question is then how can we benefit 
And what we talk about in the panel later, how can we actually use AI to solve some of these stupid problems that we've had for a long time? You well, know, one of them is compliance. Uh, money laundering we just talked about. One of the big issues probably banks are facing right now is actually false positives. If your name is John Chen or John Smith, and what happens in the history, somebody or John Smith committed to any kind of violation, they'll always flag in the bank. And now this is done by manually people dealing with these false positives. 80% of global AML costs are headcount related. These are people hired to deal with this stupid thing. Maybe that's a solution we should use uh, AI for in finance. But the reality is, it's even more complicated than that. I call the three sympathies of AI. One of them is the amount of data that is being published now every year is increasing exponentially. Second, the cost of storage is going down substantially. The cost of storage right now, a gigabyte of, of any kind of data is significantly lower than what it was a couple of years ago. <coughs> but also, the bigger issue, I call it, we call the flywheel effect. That means actually the more users you have, the better data you have, which allows you to build better products, and so on and so forth. This means that anybody has a lead will have a bigger lead. And the biggest winners of this are the large technology firms. You can imagine how difficult it is for banks to compete in an era where the technology firms have such a big advantage when it comes to data, data and the use of AI. The question is, even the technological improvements we're seeing as well. Today, 20 per, the voice, we're at 95% of being able to actually, what we call the voice recognition, uh, when we put tools like the new Amazon Echo, for example. Today, 20% of US households have an Echo device in their house. So as banking is mo moving from being one that is really driven from mobile, as user interface, to voice as your inter user interface, have actually banks a chance to compete. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But also, when you look at the banking models of the future, Douglas alluded to this in a, in a, a couple minutes ago. When today, the banks have a direct customer relationship. And we're moving to an era where, actually, a financial platform is the intermediary. And most scary for banks, large tech firms are actually the intermediary. So how do you deal with this? Well, the other issue is, you know, when we come to what's the impact on this? Are bankers the new horses? In 1900, there was about 35 million horses in the U.S. in farms being used for labor. In 1970, we stopped even doing the census. Why? Because it was a tractor. Why would you use a horse when you can use a tractor? The horses have done nothing wrong. They're as beautiful, muscular, and sexy as they were before. It just happened we have a better tool. Are we going to have the same thing with AI? Are we going to have the same thing on the future of the workforce? Many of the students in your room are going to graduate in a couple years. Are we going to have more pictures like these of the bank I used to work for at UBS, where literally this place, by the way, is shut down right now. It doesn't even exist anymore. Training for what's, what's going to be the impact? Well, I'll give you one example of banks are dealing with it, and we'll move to the panel based on that. Is actually some banks have been trying to deal with this issue. I'll give you one example. The, one of the problems was the spaghetti. What about, instead of having spaghetti, you try to have a new sheet of paper to actually build your bank. A whole new digital bank. And this is something we've seen a number of banks now actually do around the world. You know, Marcus, Goldman Sachs is doing Marcus, you've been seeing actually here in Hong Kong this week, with Standard Charter, with their own virtual bank. ING has been doing it, many other banks have been trying to do this, set up new digital-only banks, completely new teams, physically separated, that have nothing to do with the legacy of the, of the other bank, saved by the reputation. But also, why are they doing this? One is the arrival of new players. A very crowded space right now, new digital banks coming in. But also, maybe to solve the issue of trust. In this recent survey, more than half of Hong Kong consumers said they do not trust their bank. Crazy, huh? And how can the banks deal with this? Are they responsible? Well, actually, yes. If you ask any banker in Hong Kong or anywhere, they tell you we're here with the customer. We're there with the customer journey. From the cradle to the grave, we are actually with our customers. The reality is, if you ask the customers, the answer is very different. Most bank customers see actually that their bank as purely transactional. There's very few that see them as really as advice and a partner they can trust with. And actually, have the banks actually been there and have, have been caring for customers? Today in the US, 57% of Americans don't have $400 in their accounts. 43% have credit card debt for more than two years. Have the banks been there to help these clients? Actually, not really. 
Actually, overdraft fees have gone up, and pretty much a client that has a, doesn't have a lot of money can use credit cards, take a lot of loan overdrafts. Is a great client for a bank. So how can we solve this? Is AI one of the solutions that banks can use? Well, and I'll close it up with this. It's one thing we've been starting to see. With these new digital banks, the banks have been trying to see whether they can use AI to actually solve and be there and be useful for their customers. And we call it this financial health. For example, I'll go to the gym for my physical health. I'll meditate or pray for my mental health. And now, maybe can I use FinTech my financial health. And that's one thing you can only do if you have good customer data, you're close to doing it, and you're able to leverage this technology. And I'll stop here, we'll talk about this in a panel, guys. My name is Henry Asley, it was a pleasure being with y'all, and I'll bring Douglas or you to talk about uh, bringing the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Henry, and I think that gives you a nice taste to move into uh, our next session. So we, maybe I can ask you and the panelists uh, to take the floor. Thanks for that. Yeah. Is this one better? Yes. Very good. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is uh, Hui Guyen. I'm uh, the co-founder of CFT. And uh, if you've taken the HKU MOOC and one of the lectures on the, on the course, uh, I'm also one of the lecturers on the uh, Oxford uh, FinTech course, uh, as well as uh, Imperial College. Uh, and I, I think you know, that the slides of, of Henry were really good, uh, although I'm always stressed to be talking after Henry. Uh, but the slides of, of Henry and the question of uh, our bankers, the, the new horses, I think that that's a good introduction to our panel. Uh, so let me introduce you to the panel. So just next to me, we have uh, Ursula. And uh, Ursula is a partner at uh, KWM. You're also a member of the SSC uh, FinTech Advisory Group. And you're co-chair of the Policy and Advocacy Committee of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Uh, talking about the uh, FinTech Association of Hong Kong, uh, next to Ursula, we have Mushir, and Mushir is the uh, general manager. You're also the co-founder of uh, the India Tech Hong Kong group, and you're also an alum of uh, HKU through the joint MBA between HKU and LBS in London. Uh, next to Mushir is Janos. Janos is the founder of Supercharger, which is the largest fintech accelerator uh, in Asia. He's also the head of entrepreneurship at uh, um, CFT, and you're also doing your PhD here at uh, HKU. And then last but not least, we have Brian Tang. And uh, Brian, you're the MD of ACMI, and uh, you're also the funding executive director of here the initiative at HKU, the HKU Light. So shall we give a very big round of applause for our panelists? And, uh, and for you, audience, uh, you are quite a few people, but you're pretty much not everywhere in the room. So can I ask you just to come a bit closer so we can have a nice and intimate discussion? So for people, for example, at the back of the room, do you want to come a bit closer? <laughs> I know I've been a student before, but, uh, and it's a big room. But if you can come just a bit closer, and we're going to have a very interesting discussion. OK, let's do that. And uh, while we do that, uh, let me give you a bit of background you know, on this discussion about skills and AI. Uh, two days ago, uh, I was in Singapore. And uh, when I was in Singapore with Janos uh, also, we were at a lunch uh, with a Citibank. And at the lunch with Citibank, uh, we had asset managers, around 10 to 15 asset managers, quite senior on average, let's say you know, 35 to 40 years old. And I asked them the question, which was, why did you come today to hear about artificial intelligence? And do you know what the answer was? Do you know why those you know, quite you know, senior asset managers you know, were in the room to hear about AI? No? So actually, yeah, there were two answers. The first answer was, how is AI impacting the industry? So for asset management, you know, how can I use AI to is a better make you know, investment decisions? or you know, how you know, it will impact basically the companies I invest in. But actually the second question was, will I still have a job? 
you know, with AI you know, happening, you know, what is my job and will my job disappear? Uh, so that was interesting coming from people who are quite successful you know, in that industry. So I think you know, my question first is, why are we talking about this today? No, I've never had this question you know, before, two or three years ago. We never had this question, and today we have people who are quite worried about their job. And you know, perhaps, you know, Brian, do you want to start? Sure, thanks. We throw it out to me. Um, I, I think that there's a, there is an existential element to it. Right, so uh, my background is as a lawyer. I was an investment bank. Um, a lot of it is brain power, expert-based systems. All of a sudden, you have AI, which in theory um, can do all these things much better. Right, so for those uh, you know in the high echelons of society, uh, that has always been um, uh, you know the, the high priestess are the ones that have high um, expert systems and uh, high expertise. But suddenly, this is a new system which, which can uh, rock that foundation. And so I think as, as people, as the establishment and others think about what their roles can and will be in this day and age, um, uh, it behooves them to consider the different aspects. But in my mind, um, the, the key things when thinking about AI is firstly, it, ha it should be inclusive. So this is going forward. Um, secondly, uh, it needs to be interdisciplinary. So it's not just about the smart folk that can work out data and algorithms and the like. AI permeates all of society. And the third is it should be experiential in terms of everybody needs to roll up their hands and better understand and, and delve into AI to, to understand what it can do and, frankly, what it can't. Perhaps to continue on the same question, Musha, what do you think? You were on the trading floor before, so... Yeah, I was, I was a trader, did have uh, algos that we were using for trading. Um, my, I think my thing is a couple of things, just speaking specifically with asset managers. Um, a, I don't think their jobs will be gone in the next three to five years, uh, especially for senior asset management, because that means you have to have a big change on the buy side and the clients have to change. It's, it's a longer process. Now, the second thing, um, I actually feel sometimes we focus too much on AI. Uh, what I mean by that is that AI is going to change everything. AI is going to replace everybody. Yes, maybe there was an article yesterday which said tech companies should stop bullshitting people and say that, yes, your jobs are going to go and billions of jobs will go away, possibly. But it's not about AI, and it's about technology. Uh, it has to come as a whole ecosystem. A bit of what Brian was saying as well. You can't just take AI in isolation and say, if you use AI, it's going to revolutionize, everybody's going to leave. It's, it's about that ecosystem. You don't have the systems for that. You don't have the developers for that. You don't have other processes that are also in the automation AI space. Then nothing's going to change, right? And that's going to take some time. Why, is, why are a lot of people talking about it? Two main reasons. One is political big push. So you've had uh, President Xi Jinping talking about China becoming this AI superpower. So as a, you know, effect of that, most of Asia is trying to have an AI policy. US is having an AI policy. But you never heard of major economies having a specific technology policy to a specific technology. Right? You have a general technology policy. Number two is maturity of electronic hardware. You're able to crunch those numbers much faster and more consistently. AI in investment management is around 30 years old. Renaissance has been using it for 30 years. Right? They have complete automated and uh, AI-based investment policy. So I think it's, it's a question of not about just AI. You have to look at a holistic approach. And I don't think people are going to lose their jobs in the next five years if they are up to date on the whole digital transformation technology upgrade process. You don't, I think, need to know how neural networks work and all the, you know, the, the weeds of it. You just need to know that this, what is the things that can be done. Very much like what can your iPhone do, right? You can log in uh, using your Face ID. You don't need to know how the Face ID is working on the AI platform. That's, that's how I see it. And uh, Ursula, you work in a law firm and also in fintech and digital in general. So do you see this impact of, do you think that we need you know, different skills today or is it the same or has something changed? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, my industry is one that is ripe for disintermediation through technology as well. And there's a whole lot of um, processes that were automated or that were outsourced uh, many years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, there's absolutely a challenge that we need to, um, you know, uh, to, to to um, you know, visit upon ourselves as well when we when we uh, consider this issue. But looking at it more um, generally, what I find is this point um, 
that people look at AI because they feel like they should be looking at AI. Um, they look at blockchain because they feel that they should be um, looking at blockchain. And without looking at where the points of their business do not work. Um, so likewise for my own, you know, are there complete inefficiencies that could be um, you know, uh, improved through technology? And AI might be um, the answer to that or it might not be. But in terms of skills, the skill that um, typically I find, uh, you know, aside from having a general awareness around how automated systems can work and um, things around, uh, you know, use, useful use of data, um, the, the key skill that I find is typically lacking is um, the skill around questioning and really unpacking a process or a, so a proposed solution front to back to then be able to delve deeper and find the relevant issues. So often I find people are too scared to ask how an algorithm works, whether it's an algorithm to trade uh, stocks on a stock exchange or whether it's an, uh, a piece of uh, machine-based machine system uh, to determine whether or not I have the right credit score or the right um, uh, you know, background and, and, and social media behavior to be given uh, access to finance. Um, and that ability to question and break down is where we start to be able to build the solutions and, and interweave the legal and regulatory aspects. So if I break down a system, I see that I, I've got an input of data. Um, how is that data that's being collected? Is that lawful? When I'm looking all the way down to deployment, um, have I got an, a discriminatory outcome that breaches anti-discrimination laws? The other bit about it is that we've got a, now a, a real book of failures in AI as well. So learning from that experience and then applying it. Often I find it's just that person who puts their hand up and asks the question that really gets the discussion going about some of these issues rather than just allowing them to deploy. Thanks a lot. And um, so for you, one of the skills would be questioning, the ability to question. And uh, so let's talk about skills. Uh, and you know, normally, you know, when you start talking about you no know, skills, you know, in this new world, you know, there's all these questions about you know, should I be you know doing coding, not coding, you know, etc. Perhaps you know, let me ask you know, Janos, well, you know, your background you know, is on the law, you know, you were on the law side, so that's a legal background. Uh, and at the same time, you were very successful you know, on the fintech side, and you've been working with a lot of companies on the AI side. So what do you think are the skills for today? Is it coding, not coding, English, soft skills? So it's an interesting one. If you look at how long it takes you to get a bachelor's degree in law, right? It's about three, four years, depending on the country. If you look at what fintech has been doing in the last three years in Hong Kong, it's totally changed in three years. So if I would come out of my degree three years later, the question is, how is it still relevant? And, and those cycles are getting shorter and shorter. Um, so the, the point I'm making here is because cycle of innovation or cycle of disruption or cycle of technology get shorter and shorter, you're going to get more and more challenged on a duration of a long-term course versus short-term course. Um, and if you look at artificial intelligence, if you look at, so if we talk about AI, let's talk about data. If you look at hiring data, all the challenger banks in the UK, Monzo, Starling, Revolut, none of them are hiring data scientists. Starling is hiring customer support people, but they could technically do it with chatbot, but they don't. Revolut is hiring legal people, but they could use Rectech, but they're not. Um, and then Monzo is hiring uh, finance people, because they just don't have that background because they're a tech company. So where you would expect startup to essentially automate a lot of this, they're actually still hiring people that have those skills. Um, so it, it doesn't disrupt the whole market. And then in terms of the skills that you have, um, I think it, it sounds obvious, but being willing to be false and, and knowing that you don't know is a question that you should always ask yourself. I think Amazon puts it another way, which is if you look at all the big tech companies or all the listed companies in the US, the time they're going to be listed on the S&P 500 now went down to 30 years. And Jeff Bezos said, in 30 years, Amazon is not going to exist anymore. So you should always tell yourself, how can you make, be made obsolete? Because it's also going to be true for, for big companies. So human skill, interpersonal skill, working with teams, um, knowing how to write, it sounds 101 and stupid. Um, it's not necessarily something that you learn as part of a degree, because a degree forms you professionally. But I think the human skills is, is one of the things that's going to be the most needed. Uh, going forward, because that's always going to be true. Um, the rest, what you need technically, it's going to be replacing and replaced. <coughs> so we had questioning skills, human skills, uh, soft skills. 
Do you agree with uh, Janos? Do you disagree? Uh, oh, abs absolutely. So, so my little framework at the beginning was um, inclusion to make sure that everybody gets access to those skills, right? Um, it's interdisciplinary, so it really is the different aspects. It's not just the science, but the humanities and the humanness, shall we say, about it. And the third is experiential. So, so some of the, the programs that we've run, so we, we've used Dialogue Flow from Google for executives, but I've also used that to teach high schoolers to create chatbots. Um, we have introduced uh, Ducky Town, which is really um, low cost um, Raspberry Pi, for those that know systems, came out of MIT that we're introducing to computer science students here to learn about autonomous driving. Um, we uh, uh, incre you know, next week we're going to have something that we're going to do a blended learning. So it's a Andrew Ng's Coursera, a new Coursera course called AI for Everyone. Um, rather than just watching, we're going to have them all come together. We're going to do discussions of them. So that and and so these are different modalities in which we want to be inclusive of different parties across society because at the end of the day, it's going to impact everybody's lives. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, Janos that you know, soft skills are something that will not go away. Um, humans will need to still talk to humans, uh, even though the machines are the background. Wealth management is a classic case. Robot advisories can do most of the tasks that a, a portfolio manager can potentially do, but uh, most wealth, uh, as large asset managers would actually white label that solution and send that with their uh, relationship manager to their clients, all right? Uh, because the client wants to talk to a person rather than just you know speak. And they may be statistics that differ on it, but this is my call uh, as well. One thing I feel that people need um, going forward is structured analytical thinking. What I mean by that is you don't need to know how to code in a certain language. You need to know how to write an algorithm tree, right? So just uh, that's just a basic, you can understand how the structure goes, the flow goes in, then it's a lot easier. You don't, you, you, because languages also become obsolete, even though uh, we know COBOL is still being used by banks, it's a different story, but a lot of the other languages get forward and you can actually have compilers and auto uh, software for the, using the language. But I feel that's one of the things that people need to know is how can you use your structured thinking and you can apply it. Uh, a quasi product manager role, yes? No, okay. Um, so quasi product manager role in some sense, which is you don't need to be technical, but you don't you really understand the business and how technology works, will I think be very, very important going forward. You will have the technologist, but that product manager will become a lot more uh, useful in most companies. And I see that as one of the main roles growing in the next three to five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. the, the one thing I just wanted to add and, and maybe qualify it is human skills are necessary, but depending on the industry in which you are or technical skills, the speed at which you need to understand that you, what you know is not relevant anymore is different. So if you work in a startup that is highly growing, so you take a Revolut or you take you know, any company which is you know, doubling their, their customers every, every base every six months, every three months all their internal process doesn't make sense anymore because it doesn't handle their new growth and they need to fully re-engineer what they're building. And therefore, here if you think of a technical skill, well, every three months you're going to have to build a new stack to handle that growth. If you work in a large organization, you don't have that growth which is breaking the technology. The technology is going to be, so I think just be mindful of where you work. It doesn't mean that you should not necessarily think that your tech skills are not relevant and you not shouldn't necessarily think that the human skills are not important, but the speed at which you should be aware that they're not is different from one organization to the other. Um, and I was just going to add that sometimes I find the skills that uh, we learn through this process can just be applied generally. So, you know, it talked about, um, uh, you know, logic and, and, and the way in which, uh, you know, coding occurs. I mean, if you look at a piece of advice typically from a U.S. lawyer, I, I find this from Indian lawyers as well, typically it's just um, how the training has been. It comes back in a block of text and to navigate the actual answer in that block of text is extremely <laughs> difficult. Likewise, contractual drafting, often it's wrong when you break it down into its sort of subcategories. That ability to just draft plainly, simply, you know, it's the same skill set that you will ultimately need to be able to sort of code that into a smart contract. But to be brave enough to put it into simple terms, I think, is, is, is a useful skill set that you can learn from this and then apply in the real world. So you have, an, you know, uh, I would say, you know, consensus on, on soft skills. Uh, but which is very different from, for example, what Tim Cook you know, said in France you know, two or three years ago to the students. He said it's more important to learn how to code than English. 
Uh, so what do you think of that? Well, I don't know that it's necessarily... So, I mean, I think it maybe is potentially one of the most important skills, but at the same time, I mean, the, uh, the Coursera course on AI, we're running that internally as well. Um, again, getting together as a team to sort of talk about the issues. Um, you do absolutely need to make yourself aware, and I think it's just the, the degree to which really depends on your role, um, what you're doing, what you want to do with it. So for us internally, um, you know, my team that, that, that looks at emerging technologies will need to know that more than my, you know, other teams within the organisation that are much more focused on capital markets, perhaps. So they just need more of a general understanding of it. But no, I agree. Uh, you know, I think specific topics, um, you know, that, that um, are becoming increasingly important absolutely need, um, need, need um, thematic uh, you know, education as well. And just to add to that, um, so let's take, for example, evolution of just use of computers in businesses, right? Mm -hmm. You'd like, so trading, for example, when it switched from being in, in trading pits to went electronic, a lot of the old traders could not cope with it because A, they didn't know how to use mouse and uh, respond to screens, but secondly, they had a different skill set where they just look at people's faces and determine when to buy and when to sell. That was a different skill set. So inherently, they weren't used to the technology, but then Beyond, you've also gone through this process where a lot of senior managers don't know how to even today build PowerPoint presentations, right? Or use Excel sheets or code in an Excel sheet or put a macro in. But for most people, that's, it's, it's a very normal skill set that you need. So backing on what Tim Cook is saying, probably the, the idea there is you need to know coding, but as I said, again, just understand how coding is done so that you can use that for your basic stuff, but you don't necessarily need to become hardcore developers. I think that's the key difference in uh, where you need to go and how things will become just normal. You'll have to do a bit of coding to get some answers, right? So you go to SQL, for example. So that kind of story. So. But we debate this internally about whether or not our lawyers should have coding training. And you know, the, where, we, where we've come to is that we need a basic awareness to be able to, to read it and, you know, and be able to advise on where it's potentially gone wrong. But you don't necessarily need to code an entire program. And some people here would know that I organized Hong Kong's first you know, legal tech and reg tech hackathon. So it's trying to get lawyers and those in liberal arts and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, bankers to sit next to uh, developers to actually develop something, right? So often, I, I totally agree with what you said. It, to me, it's about um, all too often I find a lot of lawyers are scared of technology. That's why they didn't join the law, right? So we don't have to do the number stuff, right? So, so it's overcoming that big hurdle in the first instance. Because frankly, if you, want to under, if you want to advise on an area, you just need to understand it well enough. And then depending on which part of the spectrum you're in, some of those technologies may well be changing your own um, industry, so then how much do you need to? And I agree with your point there. You know, so, so in the same with banking, there's some aspects. It's been said that IBD, that's one of the last that will need, that you know, FinTech will touch because of the high touch. Uh, my expression is you know, that the, the, the gray-haired CEO will need another gray-haired person to advise to see whether or not they're going to um, do the M&A, right? But, but behind that gray-haired person, maybe that's an algorithm that's actually advising them. So, so, so it's part of the spectrum, but I think especially since we're in the law school, that, that willingness and ability to, to reach out and embrace it. So this coming weekend, we're, we're actually running a smart legal contract um, challenge. So again, we're re literally rolling up our sleeves to say, you know, how do we understand smart contracts and get lawyers to actually draft for smart contracts? Let, I'll tell you how it goes. It's going to be challenging. It'll be interesting. But that's part of the cutting edge of what we're, what's happening right now. But if you, you take that logic, right, of saying, like, everyone should know how to code, my next question is, like, who, who the hell is going to sell it? So, so, no, I'm actually being serious here. Is, like, in any tech company or in any, they have as many marketing people than they have technologists. Because, and this is typically the ratio that you have in, in any startup. So, if you look at the life cycle of a company, yeah, you, you code it, but for life of me, like, sometimes coders have no capacity of presenting an idea. Then you need the marketing guys. You need, so, from that perspective, this is where the complementarity comes in. And you just need to focus on saying, I'm going to specialize on that part. And if you're an early stage startup, thinking that you can do everything is going to be your own bottleneck for your own company. So at one point you need, I'm not going to touch, I'm going to have someone else to do it. But yeah, think about it. Like if everyone is a coder, who's going to sell it? And that's why you need the marketing guys still, still involved. And, and I totally agree with that. But what I'd add is, because we work in reg tech, and it's a B2B play. So all too often, my expression is, all the marketing material look the same. 
right? And they all say AI, tick, blockchain, tick, right? So you have to dig down what is the difference. And some salespeople know the tech enough to explain it, and some don't. So coming back to, you don't have to code it. You need to really understand it well enough. But, but I, it, you do need a communication skill. Yeah. Um, we ask this same question of people who will, uh, are building open source software. So it's exactly that, you know, but, but, but why? You know, but, you know, you're not going to be able to be paid for it. And typically, it's the additional layer of service that's provided over the top of it that is monetized. It's not the open source. And the open source element is to enable building and to enable better products and things to be, to be out there. But it is really different um, to the way in which we typically see products and services being delivered and, and monetized. And I mean, just add to that, it's, it's a story of the horse and the, and the cars that uh, Henry was saying. If everybody were building the, the cars, then who's selling it, right? Uh, and in today's world, it's even harder to see it physically, right? It's a lot to do with how it works in the software. So being able to display that, probably, I completely agree with Janus on that. Yeah. Let me take some questions from the room. Are there any questions you'd like to ask the panel? Yeah. Jen, do you think we can... Hello. Um, I understand that you are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, but I'll talk about overall fintech industry, some questions and doubt I have. So we are talking about data breach and data security. So this is like we're depending on uh, technological advancements. And you know that in Facebook, Twitter, there were some data breaches happened recently. So now as a retail customer, I think uh, you started your discussion with the topic that you went to Singapore asset managers asked you will my job be safe in five or 10 years? And he said that in coming three to five years, nothing will happen. But the question is, as a retail customer, suppose you are introducing a product in the market, but at the same time, there must be some people or the group of people who will accept that product. So how can you convince them that they, their financial transactions are safe if there is a data breach? Or is there any regulatory bodies who is really working on that? Like for banking transactions, they have central regulatory bodies. So if your money laundering is happening, so there's a central bank or say there are some policies, but for the new products that are coming up in the market, and this product may be totally unfamiliar to the new customers. So if data breach happens, the financial transactions are happening using his personal data. So now how the company will be liable or how regulatory bodies will take care of that? So I'll quickly go on one thing, right? We talk a lot, like recent, recently talk about Facebook data breach, right, on the password side, so what, 4 million passwords exposed. I generally believe you have the breach at the same scale at banks, but it hasn't been reported yet. Like, I fail to believe the argument that a bank doesn't have a same customer data breach that has happened on a big tech company side. So for me, that's one thing. And now with the new rules and regulation, the reporting of that breach isn't going to be compulsory. Because if you don't, then you, you breach the fact that you have to report. But I'm pretty sure that for the last 10 years, this must have happened. And it's exactly what Facebook has done and exactly what Amazon has done is, I'm not going to tell anyone until it really goes public by the willingness that they didn't want to do it. So I don't necessarily believe that banks are better than tech companies at protecting customer data. It just hasn't been reported. But that's, that's a personal view. Um, two, two points to raise. Um, one is um, a very strong movement to expanding regulatory reach beyond fintechs, which are already caught by a lot of um, legislation as well, but also now um, companies that are systemically important from a data perspective. Um, so not only looking about whether or not they have uh, you know, too much power from a competent and trust um, uh, standpoint, but perhaps uh, whether or not they ought to be overseen. Um, because the benefits of having a formal regulatory system is that it's not only where you've got a, a technical legal right that something will happen, it's often a negotiated process between the entity and the regulator. So that battleground around a lot of these, the, the large data controllers is occurring. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, there's a constant calibration of, uh, you know, between the sort of, uh, to address risk um, and to address, uh, you know, a number of these emerging technologies through regulation, yes, but also the development of the technology itself. So one of the key um, development uh, focus areas that I'm seeing is the decentralization of data, the development of decentralized self-sovereign digital identities, looking at how we can remove the, or, or lessen 
um, the, the central points of weakness um, so that we don't have this, this scale of breach or misuse to the point where we don't even care anymore because it's all out there. Just, I think to answer your question specifically on how is it happening, there are enough, all the governments now, major governments have a data commissioner. So like in Hong Kong, there is a uh, office, of da there is a data commissioner who looks in. So from your Cathay breaches all the way to if an HSBC has a breach, they will be liable to answer to them. So any company that goes through it, they are responsible for it. And they are, you're getting more cyber security laws from a government national perspective. Like in China, there's huge strong cyber security laws on all, how to deal with all of these. So it's, it's already out there. It's just a matter of people adding that layer to their businesses or not. And convincing your clients just lies down with you providing the information. And if the client actually cares, which I think most clients usually don't look at big companies when they ask you to sign those 50 page uh, documents but you probably for a small company may look but after a while you just move on so, yeah. yeah and look on this you know I mean I, I think there's been a failure in consent models because nobody reads terms and conditions um, and so um, the movement of um, like GDPR in uh, in Europe to look more at the legitimate interests of, of users is being litigated and there's really interesting decisions that are coming out of Europe around whether or not the use of um, customer data is is right. Trust, though, it's you know it's interesting because you know we talk to our clients um, not just often about the, the the strict legalities of their product, but you know how they are generating trust. How are they disclosing their um, their uses? Are they burying things that they really should bring up um, to the fore? And sometimes people will say, well, actually, I don't want to make that prominent because I don't want my customers to know because I don't want them to complain about it, which is, which is concerning. Can I take another question from the room? Yes. Yeah, Ted Clark, University of Science and Technology. Um, a recent uh, news article said that uh, Goldman Sachs is laying off thousands of workers. They've laid off thousands of workers in the past several years. At the same time, they've hired, as they laid off 2,000 people in finance, they hired 1,600 programmers. I find it interesting when you say your jobs aren't going away, and I do agree that somebody's got to sell tech, and somebody's got to do something with people. But I also see that traditional jobs are under threat, and this is not like five years from now. This is the past 20 years we've seen this evolving and happening. Yes, you're going to you're not going to be able to stay the same as the industry needs are changing. Probably that's the, I, I, I mentioned the fire plan, uh, Mark, so I, I'll respond it. Mine was specific on the asset management side. When you look at Goldman and some of the investment banks, even JP Morgan called themselves a tech company. Now 40% of their staff is IT or more than that, right? Now the question there is, A, Goldman has a 5% bottom layer cut off every year, where they fire 5% of the staff. Considering they already have 30,000 plus staff, that's a 1,500 number there, uh, right? And the new ones that are hiring are going, going into technology and platforms. So it's a change in the business re in, I, I happening. And the other thing that's happening is on the upper end, right? So Goldman, JP Morgan, a lot of investment banks are hiring uh, or letting go of more senior managers and inducting more juniors because the cost metrics change. That's number one. Second is, you're right, uh, there are certain jobs that are going to go now, but in certain cases, it's because the person has not kept up to date with the way things are going. So as a trader, let me come to that, right? JP Morgan uh, or Goldman and Standard Chartered, for example, their equity desks have gone from 200 to five people. Reasoning, the model changed and people didn't keep up to it. So if you were able to code or keep up to what were the changes, and then you, you'll still stay there. But if you did not keep up with the change in skill set, then you'll go away. So that's being aware about the ch change in skill sets that are required is there, and it's not to do with AI. That's what I'm saying specifically AI, no. Technology, yes. And that's the key difference in how we look at it, because AI is not yet fully mature in across the field. But technology, I completely agree, but not on AI. But if you look at banks in Asia, so if you take a DBS or UOB, they hired another 15% of their staff year on year. They're actually growing their staff size, because their profit is going up 30%. Right? So it's also part of how, how well the bank is doing. And in Asia, UOB and DBS have been hiring another between 15 to 30% extra staff, as opposed to stay flat and you know, reduce and rehire the same number. So I think there's a regional profitability pressure and return on equity that the Asian bank have not done, but also because DBS have done that huge tech transformation, and now they've been looked like a tech company. So, And what I would add to that is I think it depends also on your level of seniority, right? So um, if you're 
a much more senior manager, you know, there's always a, a lifespan to the job, but then if you want to get the higher jobs these days, there's a higher focus on, on senior management and in, in boards to have be more tech savvy. As you go further down the track, um, down the ages, I should say, that's where um, MOOCs and other ways to keep up to date have become very relevant, and um, so that's a timely plug. Um, but as you go further down, then it's universities. So universities are trying now to encourage more students across the field to say, no matter what discipline you're studying, you should incorporate STEAM into it, right? And I add the A for the arts, specifically. And then as you go further down even, um, you go into the middle school and the high schools. Because ultimately, that's who, those are the ones in terms of how they decide before they go into university. So I think societally, uh, there is this trend towards um, uh, the better skilling. Uh, execution, as you know, is, is often the key, and whether or not that's done properly uh, or better or not. Um, but again, I come back to hopefully being inclusive about it so that, that we are conscious in terms of everyone across society having the same access to, to that skill set. Otherwise, we'll have a, uh, a, a greater digital divide um, as time evolves. Yeah, and I think speaking about uh, I think uh, divides, I think the, the questions around, okay, well, look, if that is the end state that there's a lot more machine-based systems, AI involved, what is it that we're wanting to create? What does good look like? And um, you often don't get enough, I think, in those discussions. There's a lot of fear, and I think we all feel it, you know, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, talk about it, the singularity and then, you know, but there isn't, a, a you know, as much talk about how do we balance the negatives, what is it that we want to create? But, you know, um, there are discussions about, you know, universal basic income, you know, whether or not tax structures are already broken from a, from, from a divide standpoint. So I think those are the discussions that I think are, are particularly interesting, um, you know, when we talk about it. That, that's a very interesting question because uh, we work with a lot of banks around the world, and that's not the trend uh, we see. Uh, the trend we see is that uh, you do have some banks which do have uh, you know, issues of profitability. A lot of the European banks that have shed 20% you know, of their employees over the last 10 years, and that are usually the banks today which are not using digital or innovation at all. They're really the laggards, and they're falling behind, and because they're falling behind, their strategy is to cut people. Uh, so this is not because of technology at all, this is an issue of profitability. At the same time, we work with some banks which are doing really well on the innovation side, and their issues, they're not trying to cut people at all. Their issues that they don't find enough talent to hire. And so what they're doing is that they're deploying all those internal programs to upskill and train their employees because they can't hire enough good people at the moment. So they're not, uh, so in the case of DBS, over the last 10 years, they have doubled the number of people that they have. So what they're doing is that they're using technology very aggressively, and what you would see in terms of numbers, I don't know if you've seen, uh, uh, one of the documents you should be reading is the Technology Investor Day of DBS, which is really interesting. And what do they say about you know, technology? Normally you think of technology in terms of cost reduction. You know, I'm just gonna replace someone, I'm, I'm gonna cut my cost. What DBS shows you know, from their findings is that by using technology, they have the same cost, but they double their revenues. Exactly the same cost, but they doubled their revenues. So what does it mean? It means that they have just doubled the number of people that they've had over the last 10 years. Um, I'll give you one other example of that where uh, I think technology only adds to uh, what an organization is doing, and that's in the area of financial crime, and I know that we've got experts in the room on that side. Um, so dual-use goods is a, is a very significant issue. Dual-use good is something that can be used for the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, and there's a 200-page-old list, that, uh, old list that's published by the EU, by China, and others. A mobile phone is a dual-use good because you can use it to, 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 to trigger a bomb. Now, many financial crime teams uh, you know, you know, you know, globally will not even be looking at it because it is too hard to even start to look at that. There's just an impossibility to be able to look at whether or not a particular shipment of mobile phones is a problem or not. Now, when you add um, you know, big data to that, you can crunch so much useful data to work out whether or not you've got a particular suspicion. You can look at, you know, you look at what's, what else is on that shipment. You look at where it's going. You're looking at who the customers and others are. So automatically, you're starting to generate some really interesting um, information that financial crime professionals can now do something about it. They can look at the patterns. They can analyze them. They can take that risk-based approach that they're requiring to do that they never would have really been able to, to, to have actually addressed before. 
Thanks, sir. Just on that, right? So there is a bank which I can't name, but uh, they deployed AI for uh, red flags on onboarding and KYC and for financial crimes. Uh, unfortunately, um, because there were so many false positives, they have a 300-member team sitting in southern China, humans who are deciding which positives are right and which positives are wrong. So instead of reducing the number of people employed for the same task, they now added about 300 more people on the same thing. Right? And it's actually a fact that there's probably some of us know which bank it is, but I can't mention it. Thanks. Can I take a last question from the audience? There is. Yeah, hello. I'm York. I'm a lawyer like a lot of the other people on the panel. I have a question based on Janos's comment who said that uh, higher education that takes a lot of time to complete, like a law degree and then a PCLL, might not make a lot of sense if you don't know whether in three, four years technology has advanced and what you have learned is obsolete or no longer required in the market. Sitting here at HKU's uh, law faculty, I wondered whether you can make a case why studying law or any other university degree that takes a lot of effort, a lot of grit to do, is still valuable. Thank you. So, so <laughs> I, I'll, clearly, I'll, I'll clearly take that. The good thing is I do have an answer for it. Um, look, I also studied at Hong Kong U, so I did, I did my master's here and, and doing my PhD. Hong Kong U as a university is willing to change to the point that it created the first online fintech course in Asia, which is a short course, and now it's a series of short courses I think will be talked to be after. So I'm, I'm not saying that long-term bachelor's education is not necessary. That's not what I'm saying. But if you want to have the right skill at any moment in time, short course education is the way to go because of that cycle where you're going to get cr crushed. So technological application is one of, those, uh, one of those ideas of it. So financial technology, so how technology is used in finance, it's something that you're better off learning on a short course because this is going to be updated all the time. Take crypto or blockchain. What it was a year ago is not what it is today. It did a 180 degree turn of it. If you look at financial institution, three years ago we said they would be displaced by fintech companies. Today we're saying that actually financial institution can give a very good go at financial technology startup is what Marcus has done. So I think even the Hong Kong new fintech course is being updated on a monthly basis by people coming and doing it. Now, try to do this in a university context. A, it's going to depend on which cohort you graduate from, right? Because it's three-year cycles. But B is, do you even have access to that information? As opposed to the Hong Kong new MOOC, it's updated across the 40,000 learners when you have new content. So th there's a difference on what you want to learn and when you want to learn it. But I think that if you think about what is relevant in five years from now, a bachelor's degree can be tricky because of how much time it takes to design a curriculum and to release it. Hong Kong U is doing a bachelor's degree in FinTech, which is a three years degree, which I think the School of Engineering and the School of Business. Designing a bachelor's degree, which is credit bearing, is something that took, what, a year and a half? The Hong Kong U got released in six weeks, six months. So, so there's a delivery time to market element which is critical that I think universities have to reduce. And that's where the online offering is going to be very important. I, I'll just go back to, uh, so if you look at courses, right, over history, 2,000, 3,000 years, people used to go specifically in universities, it's not a new concept. Uh, and the number of years is different. Sometimes people used to spend five, 10 years learning the art of archery, right, for example. But the, the pace of change has, has been different. So laws especially legal, though I'm not a legal person, I think the laws are not going to dramatically change. We're still looking at archaic 100-year-old laws which still apply in today's world across the base. So I don't think that's going to change dramatically. They'll be adjusted. But the key element is, are you going to university for gaining one specific skill set? I am from India, right? I did my engineering and industrial engineering and management uh, with a minor in business management, right? Uh, majority of my classmates are in tech. I've never done any coding. Uh, because the the companies hiring them took them on board because of their logical <laughs> skill set, their uh, way of structured thinking, and then they trained them. Uh, I joined as a trader in trading fixed income and interest rate commodity futures, uh, which is unheard of. I never heard of it during my education as well. And I, I did fairly well just because it's not that complex to understand once you get in. So I think it's less about what you actually learn during your degree and more about how you apply it post your uh, education and what you learn from there. 
and I think that's a different way of looking at things. And so education is not going to change where courses will go away. You will learn the mindset of understanding how laws to be studied and how you react to it and how it's subjective uh, or objective. So, yeah. And I'll just add one, one more thing, which is time sensitivity depends on your age, right? So if you are already a lawyer working, saying you're going to do three years of a bachelor's degree today, you're not going to say yes. So this is why masters, MBAs are one year, and this is why this is getting shorter and shorter. Because universities have two pools of revenue, right? Undergrad, postgrad, and then executive training. For undergrad, postgrad, when you talk about what did you learn at university, most people will say, my network and my friends. They're not going to tell you that course. So that's the soft skill of talking about people. Then when you look at exec executive education, this is where also those online courses are serving that segment. So they are actually different in, in how you look at it. And executive education, doing them shorter and shorter, not only fits the professional requirements, but also the way where technology is going. And executive education was something that has always been a smaller child of universities compared to bachelor's, master's, and PhDs, because it hasn't really been done at that scale, but now it's happening. So there's also who you're trying to teach a bachelor's degree to. Yeah. Um, and then just to add, um, in favor of law school, um, <laughs> we learn legal reasoning, statutory interpretation, principles of justice. Um, these are the backbones of so many of our institutions. It's whether you're a lawyer, you go into politics, you become a business leader. Um, there is so much. And I think in favor of doing that deep dive where you're, it's drilled into you. Now, there's another question about then continuing education. Absolutely, it must be fast paced. But you know what I learned in equity and trusts back in Australia no longer applies from a PPSA perspective, but it doesn't matter. It's that continually evolving uh, learning. What I find, though, is that that continual learning, there's some that are better than others. So a lot of us will be on LinkedIn and we'll click at the pretty pictures and the big headlines and all of that, but how many of us do spend that time to read that long read, to go and do that fintech MOOC where it is actually quite a deep dive to do some of the IEEE <laughs> stuff on AI, to do the Coursera course. That still can be a deep dive, but just in a compressed period of time. So, so just to add to that, because I am now back at a university, at a law school in particular, um, and I do agree with that. Uh, a lot of that because, so I did, I'm a liberal arts background, I did a double degree, um, and then I did my master's. So, um, so yes, I do like the law and the study of the law, but I think it does instill in one the, the fundamentals. And um, so I start with the fundamentals, and then there's the concept, as, as has been alluded to already, in relation to lifelong learning. And that's a mindset. There are modalities now in relation to online learning. But some of the things that I'm playing with, with, with Light and the Light Lab and the Light community, is actually developing things on an ongoing basis. Um, because, and through peer learning, we're learning the wonderful thing about AI and, and blockchain. Every day is different, right? <laughs> it's always changing. And that's OK, right? But when we are doing analysis of autonomous vehicles, or on smart con legal contracts, we're doing contract law 101, right? You need to understand an equity, you know, and, 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 and interpretation. Um, when we're dealing with autonomous vehicles, we're looking at policy issues on insurance, on liability and the like. If you didn't have your fundamentals, how do you think about these, these new technologies? And by the way, the technology will change in five years, but the analysis will remain the same and needs to evolve as well. So thanks a lot, Brian. So I think it's a great way to conclude this uh, panel. Uh, I would suggest that we can continue the discussion with the panelists after uh, for lunch. But uh, first, no, let me thank you, our panelists, and thank you, audience. Thanks, Sui, and uh, thanks to, to the panelists. I think uh, a very good discussion, and I think it really takes us into the next sex segment. And I think when we're looking at these issues about uh, AI and its potential impact on the world, we have to think of it from really three different levels. The first is from the societal standpoint. In other words, I think it's a fact that when we think about automation and its impact on a certain level of jobs in the context of a broader society and an economy, there are large numbers of jobs that are potentially vulnerable. But there are also positives. At the same time, many of those people are finding that they are being asked to do things that are more worthwhile than 
data entry or tracking changes in a handwritten form. So there are positives and negatives from a societal standpoint. But it's something that as societies, I think there are very big risks that if we don't think about strategically, there are some pretty serious negative potential outcomes not too many years down the road. The second is really from the standpoint of universities, and I, I really enjoyed that, that question and that discussion, not just because I work at one, but because the reason I work at a university is I like universities, I like learning, I like studying. So it's an environment that I think one always has to be thinking about what are you doing? And it has to be thought of in the context of the wider society. And from the standpoint of universities, we have to be changing the things we're doing. We have to be introducing a much different mix uh, of hard, soft skills so that our students, when they come out, do have the basic foundations to move forward. And finally, I think, is from the standpoint of individuals. And I think that this is one where um, the sort of uh, age point in some ways becomes particularly relevant. And it's something that we've seen in many of the trade discussions that are taking place in different countries uh, around the world. You know, if you're young and you have many opportunities, what should you study? Well, lots of good things to think about. I think we all know don't study radiology. That is an industry that is definitely on its way out. So individuals, young people, you want opportunities, but you want to think about it. As you get older, the potential consequences of downsizing, of industry changing, become more severe, more cliff edge types of decisions. And it is certainly the case that in many societies, Russia and the United States would be examples of this, that you have had a very large number of often middle-aged white men whose industry has ended over the past 20, 30 years, and they don't have a future. And I think for many of us, that's something that we have to take on board. And this really takes us to short courses, continuing education, executive education. What do we do? And that really brings us into our last segment of discussions today. And that is really around some of the things that those of us here today uh, are trying to do. And I'll invite uh, Brian back up to talk a little bit about uh, the LIGHT program. Brian. Thanks so much, Doug. So uh, you've heard a little bit from me over, oopsie. Yes, please, thank you. So you've heard a little bit from me already, so this will uh, provide hopefully a little bit more context in relation to the new uh, light lab at HKU that, that's, that's being set up. So by way of background, um, I went to law school in Australia. Um, I joined Malsons, as it then was there uh, in Australia, before I did my Master's of Law in, in NYU and then joined Sullivan Cromwell in New York and, and, and Silicon Valley. I joined Credit Suisse, uh, being in-house, uh, covering ECM, DCM, M&A, and was uh, on the executive board of the Corporate Council Association. And then I left to go into startup land. Um, so where I set up ACMI, and I've got initiatives in the social enterprise space. I'm the co-chair of the uh, FinTech, uh, the, the RegTech Committee of the FinTech Association, um, and also um, involved with the IEEE's Global uh, AI Ethics Initiative. So, so this is by way of background, um, and um, so in some ways I had left the law, um, but uh, earlier last year I learned about this thing called a global legal hackathon, and I thought it's a wonderful opportunity to bring lawyers and, um, and technology and innovation together. And because of that, I have Doug to thank for tapping me on the shoulder and, and saying, you know, will I help launch something here at Hong Kong U? We also participated in the um, Legal Hackers, where we talked about blockchain innovation and policy in Hong Kong, including the um, Hong Kong Monetary Authority. So as some of you may know, so how many lawyers do we have in the room here, or law students? Okay, about 
about half-ish. So, so, so um, you may know about the Law Society. The Law Society had organized a Access to Justice Hackathon, which is great, and mainstreaming some of the, um, the efforts here uh, in terms of lawyers being involved in technology and in innovation. So when I set up LIGHT, the, the idea was an acronym, Law, Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, these are phrases up there which are not typical law school type phrases. So, in, you, to use Janos's words, these would be soft skills, right? Talking about innovation, it's a, it's a bit interdisciplinary and experiential aspects, which I talked about. Um, are we able to embrace technology, entrepreneurship, and, and collaboration? So, the light course will actually be slotted into the fintech specialization of the Bachelor of Arts and Science uh, degree, as well as uh, the uh, Design Plus degree led by architecture. So, again, very much interdisciplinary. Um, we, we soft launched uh, as part of Fintech Week um, and are supportive of various initiatives here in Hong Kong U, including student led clubs in the blockchain space. And to date, um, you've heard about some of these initiatives I, I mentioned already. Ducky Town is something that we're getting computer science students sitting next to law students to learn about autonomous driving and the policy elements while they're learning about the, 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 uh, the algorithms as well. Um, supporting entrepreneurship with Jumpstarter and Alibaba. Um, we've also invited um, global leaders to Hong Kong U. So I, 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 I like this because I think the, we, we're, we're inviting engineers to come to law school and they go, who's that? What's that? Right? Why is he wearing a wig? Right? So, so these, uh, you know, so for those that don't know, this is Sovereign, which is, um, one of the leaders in relation to distributed, um, ident uh, digital identity. Um, and, um, this is, uh, Charles Hoskinson, who is the head of Cardano and the co-founder of Ethereum. Um, we've, we, uh, ha we had a hackathon recently and I've got some, a video to show you for those. So who've, who's been to a hackathon before? Oh, a handful. Very good, right? So this will give you, I want to give you a feel for what hackathons are all about. And we were able to get the Department of Justice there as a judge, um, the Securities and Futures Commission as mentors and the HKMA as, as, as observers. Um, we are, the intention here is to introduce more law students to be integrated into the uh, startup community and vice versa. Um, how I explain it is law permeates everything um, and, and every aspect of a startup. And, and alas, all too often startups place legal compliance as one of the last issues. Um, so we're working together with Idendron and we recently held a, a, a tech startup law um, initiative and, and we'll be growing from there. And going forward, as I mentioned, last next weekend we've got a smart legal contract challenge um, going to be held at Idendron and also the AI for Everyone meetup. So if you're interested in that, um, go watch the free Coursera course. But what we found that was is lacking often is the ability for people, rather than just watching in front of their screens, to be willing and able to talk to others about what they've learned and the like. And that's the community we're building there as well. So maybe, Jen, if I can have your assistance. Um, I'm just going to leave off by, um, this is our community that we're building. So join our community here. And we'll show you a little video of our uh, hackathon, which uh, um, literally was just finalized. So part of the skill sets we have here, the, the video editing was done by a law student, right? Uh, the, the videoing was done partly by a journalism students. So there's a lot of talent in this university here. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, of course and of course, there's a technical issue I with all of these. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Oops. Is this meant to be like this? Oops. All right, let's. No. Do I think, um... Maybe not. Well, we'll be posting this up uh, soon. Yeah, sorry, we'll share this another time. You know, we didn't want any ep epilepsy kind of prone people to have any yeah, problems we... here. So um, again, uh, we welcome all of you to join our community. It's going to be an undergraduate course. And some people are saying, why can't we do that as well? But by building a community, we want to be inclusive of all of you, regardless of your seniority, your experience, and the like. Um, thank you so very much. Thanks, Brian. What's a tech event without uh, some tech?
problems. Um, I think moving from that standpoint of the law, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, I'd like to move over to something that I've been very proud to be involved with, CFTE, the Center for Finance, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. And in particular, I think they're going to be talking about a couple of issues that we've highlighted throughout, both the AI standpoint, but also where we started out today with questions around ecosystems. I'd like to bring uh, Hui and Janos uh, back up uh, for this. Thanks, guys. So, hi again. I'm trying to understand how it works. Perfect. And uh, so, um, so here I'm going to take my hat as a co-founder of, uh, of CFT. Uh, and, you know, CFT is one of the partners on the HKU MOOC. And um, uh, so we've been involved, you know, pretty much you know, since the beginning. And we had the discussion, I think it was a bit more than two years, actually, with, uh, with uh, Douglas and Janos about doing this course. And uh, what I'd like to do first is that I, I'd like to congratulate you know, Douglas for this. Uh, I've been working with a lot of different universities, and getting this kind of project off the ground is a humongous task. It's really, really, really difficult. Why? Because universities are very large institutions, and it takes time to change universities. And getting this kind of course, the quality of this kind of course out there, and having 35,000, 40,000 people to take it is just humongous. So congratulations to Glass and the team for, for doing this. And uh, I wanted to talk about a few things. Uh, first, you know, AI and finance, then extrapreneurship and local chapters. But first, you know, let me tell you, you know, what we do in CFT and what we believe in. We believe in the fact that today's world of finance is incredible. A lot of things are being built today for tomorrow's world of finance. And what does it mean? It means huge impact on society, better financial inclusion, better products, better services for all of us, in terms of consumers or in terms of organizations. So incredible things are happening. What we think also is that there are huge opportunities for us in terms of people. Now, our motto is that in the tech world, we bet on people. So with all of the things happening, there are incredible opportunities for those who have the right knowledge and the right skills. The question is, how do we make it happen? You know, if I've been in banking for the last 20 years, how do I get the right skills? How do I get the right knowledge? This is what we're trying to do with a CFT. And let me show you one of the examples, which is AI in finance. So AI in finance is a course we co-designed with Nian Polytechnic in Singapore last year. It took us 7,000 hours to go around the world to find the best people to talk about artificial intelligence in finance. We did due diligence on 240 people out of which we kept five senior lecturers and 18 contributing experts. What did I get you know, from this course, AI in Finance? I got the fact that a lot of things are happening in that space, but very few people know about it, and very few people want to share about it. So our objective was to go and find the people who are very good and who are willing to share about it. And these are these kind of people, for example, the former group CTO of UBS, the chief innovation officer of Citi, the uh, Chief Strategy Officer of Ping An Technology, or the co-founder of ADO. Amazing people who really understand what's happening. But on top of that, we have 18 additional people who you can see here. Why did we do this? You know, why did we do all this work? Because as you've mentioned before, as we've discussed, in today's world, we need to have the information where it is. And what do you see, you know, AI being done today. It's being done in some of the large banks, some of the startups, some of the universities, some of the tech companies. So we had to go and find these people. And let me show you basically what is behind this course. Right now, the learning one. It means that we 
appropriating solutions which are able to learn from human beings. These professionals have a tremendous opportunity ahead of them in an AI enabled world. If you don't have a basic understanding, regardless of what role you have in a bank, you will be left behind as the bank innovates and pivots using AI. I think they'll just stop and learn. I might, I, there's no easy way out. It's really about what we can call today the proxy policy of evolution. Professionals in finance, including me, are learning how to adapt to AI. So this is a course we launched last year. I think in w less than two minutes, it summarizes what I think is happening in AI today, which is it's happening very quickly. There are huge opportunities if you have the right skills. Uh, so whether you want to take our course or other courses, uh, what I would suggest is make sure you understand what's happening because it is happening much faster than what anyone else, uh, of us know, expect. Uh, and, you know, if you're interested to take our course, then, you know, go to the website. Uh, there's a discount. Uh, and then if you want to take other courses, take other courses. Now, my view is that, that it is core basic skills that we need to have in today's world. You know, as you know, we had you know, with the HKU MOOC, as we have with this, you know, there's more and more you know, out there. It's just a question of mindset. So just get the right mindset and make sure that you learn you know, from all of the things which are available you know, out there. So that's the first initiative. Uh, let me tell you about the second one and get Janos to come back on stage and to talk about extrapreneurship. being able to announce this uh, again at Hong Kong U is, is quite great because like I said about a year and a half ago we announced the Hong Kong U course uh, and then it was very very successful so Hong Kong U tends to be the place where we announce uh, new, new releases um, and that's one of them. Essentially at May 2020 in Asia um, essentially four or five days ago we announced a new program it's called Extrapreneurship and it's built on a very simple observation. It's the observation whereby in a fast-moving world having the mindset of an entrepreneur is very valuable. Now, there's two types of people that, that need the mindset of an entrepreneur. The first one are entrepreneurs themselves. But an entrepreneur, to think like an entrepreneur is, is a bit of a no-brainer. But for a large corporate, to think like entrepreneurs is more challenging. For the same reason that we said speed is not the same factor in a large organization versus a small organization. And so a lot of things have been tried. In-house entrepreneurs in residence. They're great, but they're also here to you know, figure out the system. They work 20% less. They're happy, but they're not going to stay. Accelerators, which I founded, Hackathon, which we've tried, but it changes the culture of 20, 30, 50 people in an organization that could be 20, 30, or 100,000 people large. So the question was, how can we bring the value of the entrepreneurial mindset without having people to leave their job, take the risk of being an entrepreneur, and do it on a part-time basis exactly the same time as they do their business as usual work? So I'll show you a video, and after that I'll tell you more about why it started in Hong Kong and what we're going to do next. And so this is what the entrepreneurship course is all about. It will put financial professional in the context of a startup where they'll be able to apply the knowledge that they have, payment, challenger bank, money transfer, big data, AI, B2B, it doesn't really matter, in a startup that has issued us a case study. Just like anything, we, we've tried it before and we've done that with one of a Hong Kong startup that went through Supercharger that is part of the course and also Natalie will hear about is also part of that company, they call Neat. 
They're one of Hong Kong's first challenger bank. They work on, on the SME side. And we need, we wanted to see something. Can we get people from outside an organization to work inside an organization, in that context, a startup, and create something valuable on both sides? On the learner side, for them to apply knowledge, and on the startup side, for them to see if they can get inside of something they knew they didn't know. And it actually did work. SM Need came to us and said, we are a challenge bank for SMEs, and we want to find methods to acquire more SMEs across ASEAN, how we would do this. We put 50 learners from about 12 different countries, and we built them across different teams of five people. Certain teams were all based in the same country, for example, Singapore. Certain teams were fully remote across five continents. And at the end of the program, three things showed up. The first one is knowing is good, applying is better. And what that means is when you look at the challenger banking space, I think we know what it is, but until you work in a challenger bank, you don't actually necessarily know the limitation that they have. They come in different flavors. Certain challenger bank will look at the student side, and certain challenger bank will look at the SME side, versus other will just be on the large value transfers. The second one is people don't fully understand what it is to be an entrepreneur, but neither should they build a startup to do so. The personal cost, the financial cost, the emotional cost of doing a startup can be very, very high. So how can we instill that? And we run that first program between Christmas and Chinese New Year. Now what that means is less time with your family and you still need to hit that deadline. And a lot of people were asking us, can you actually move it forward? And we said, no, because why? Actually, entrepreneurs have to do that around the year. And David's only time to review you is during Chinese New Year. Why? Because most of his staff will take a holiday. And that's the only off time for him to work. And the third one was lurk working with new tools and skills. Most of you are using now WhatsApp more and more in a professional context, but there's other tools that you haven't necessarily used. Zoom, Slack, Google Drive. A, because it's limited by your institution. B, because you actually don't know the potential of what they do. And so cloud-based tools, applying what you know, and trying to be an entrepreneur is the free programs and the free insight that we got from the NEED program. Now that it worked, we actually decided to scale it. And we scaled it with who? With what we call the Billion Dollar Club. It's the largest fintech companies that we went around the world. So we look at about 4,000 companies. We only selected 50. And those 50 companies will gradually, on a rolling basis, introduce case study in which you can work on if you want to apply your knowledge and experience working in a startup. The first two that we do publicly now are Revolut and Shift Technology. Revolut doesn't need a lot of introduction. They raise 400 million. They're one of the fastest growing challenger bank. And for them, it's about how do I go in a new market, for example, like Brazil. So if you have knowledge in money transfer, in challenger banking, or payments, working within Revolut for only eight weeks is one way that you can apply and test your knowledge. The second company that people may know less is Shift Technology. B2B companies typically don't impact you on a day-to-day -day basis because they sell to financial institutions. But Shift Technology, as a company which is only three years old, has been able to get 70 tier one insurance company registered on them. How? by applying artificial intelligence to better detect fraud risk when it comes to insurance claims. They're growing incredibly fast, and last week they closed a round of 70 million US, and they have one problem, which is how do they go from 200 staff to 400 staff? And doing so at the same time as resegmenting a market, which is their UK market, they have all the tier one insurance company, but now they're looking at tier two companies. And so if you have knowledge on the B2B side, on application of AI, or on big data analytics, then Shift Technology would be one company in which you can apply your knowledge. So the CFTX program will start its registration next week. Um, so if you're interested, simply go on extrapreneurship.org. Uh, you'll be able to see all the details about it. Uh, and then after this, we're going to start rolling other companies, which are all companies that raise more than essentially Series B, Series C, so that you get to work in a high growth company, and they'll be able to test your knowledge and find your experience of working in a startup. There you go. And I think we can also introduce the chapters. And if you have questions about the entrepreneurship program, you can ask also local chapters. Thanks a lot. And I'll just finish on the local chapters in one second, because I know we're out of time and Doug will kill me. Uh, so the local chapters, is uh, we're, ha we're having a very, very big community around the world, more than 100 countries. We launched the local chapter in Singapore last week. We're launching one in Hong Kong this week. The idea is very simple. Um, as you said, no, learning is great. But you know, learning together is better. You know, the social part is much better. Exchanging is much better. How do we do that you know, through you know, this kind of events? At CFT, we do one event you know, every other week on average. This week, we have one every day. So we're saying to have a lot. But you know, what we would like is many you know, our alumni to drive this. 
Uh, and so in Hong Kong, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Natalie, uh, Natalie Wong, who's here, and uh, uh, who's at NEAT, actually, and uh, Karen Chang. I don't know if Karen is here. Uh, I think you know, she came, but she had to leave. Uh, who will be uh, driving the local chapter of CFT uh, in Hong Kong. So if you're interested you know, by events, and I think that we'd like to do more and more events you know, together with uh, Douglas and you know, Hong Kong University, really with the idea of meeting people, getting interesting discussions, getting experts you know, to fly in and to discuss, you know, just make sure that you, know, you connect to them. You know, it's a very, very open you know, community, and you know, whatever you're interested in, you know, just make sure that you bring it you know, yourself into the community. Thank you very much. Thanks, we. Thanks, Jonas. And I think that really highlights uh, a couple of things. One, if we think about what the light program is about, one of the core. There we go. Core aspects of the light program is actually about linking students with, in particular, startups and entrepreneurs. So I think uh, it's something that. Uh, the opportunities from both sides uh, to work together are going to be very exciting. I would also like to throw out two quick things. First, Natalie. Natalie was one of the core team that developed uh, the online course. So Natalie was actually the glue that really brought most of all of us, the instructors, together with the tech team from Ellen's team, who is just sitting right below, uh, right behind, uh, Natalie to make it uh, all happen. Uh, and I think that really takes us to the question from the university side of what are we doing next? And uh, I think most of you will have seen the announcements about the Hong Kong U professional certificate in FinTech. The key to that is two new courses. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the two course leaders, David Lee and David Bishop, can't be here today but I'd like to bring up John Peterson, uh, who is their equivalent of Natalie in putting together that course to say just a couple of words. And the key thing about this course is it opens next month. Thank you, Doug. So as Doug said, so I'm the project coordinator for the, the FinTech uh, HQ FinTech uh, on uh, ethics and risk, where we're exploring those areas. Um, I'm not necessarily the guy that should be here in front of uh, on a scene or in front of a camera. I am the project coordinator and kind of enjoy being on the backside. But unfortunately, we're not the, the two instructors, David Bishop and David Lee, they could not attend today. So you stuck with me for just a few minutes, okay? I'll be quick. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time today, but I want to give you a little bit of a, a uh, a taste into what we're doing with our MOOC. Uh, as you all know, the intro to FinTech uh, was uh, had learners from all around the world. They had great instructors, had great technical assistance from the tele team. Uh, so we were really fortunate to stand on their shoulders as we were developing our course. And especially so as we sought to kind of build on the information and the frameworks that they, they uh, provided in the, in the first course. So throughout this uh, course on ethics and risk, we are exploring some thought-provoking dilemmas and case studies and kind of prospective positive or negative implications of fintech and technological innovation. Um, as opposed to the, to the intro course, uh, which had leading kind of fintech experts, our course takes a more of a layman approach in the sense that we don't necessarily know all there is to know uh, in regards to fintech, um, but the two Davids behind me here are uh, both former lawyers and are kind of thought leaders within like business law and ethics, and so they are able to provide and kind of take apart the promises or the forewarnings or the implications or the unintended consequences that fintech may have. Um, and to also explore that through various ethical lenses or other kind of cultural or societal lenses. So an important, an important thing as well is that this course is not necessarily here to kind of give you the, the answers um, to what you should do or you shouldn't do, 
but as with most of ethics, it's about a kind of a journey exploring and kind of thinking about um, this topic and facilitate further discussion, like and where about we're heading or where do we want to head up to. So the course is broken into six modules. The first module focuses on kind of considering the role of money, the role of banks and banking, and the role of technology from a historical perspective and then up until today. Um, and then we'll explore like the implications and effects on society so that we kind of have a good framework to consider the future. Then the second module digs into blockchain and smart contracts and the various kind of potential challenges or issues within that sphere. Then the third module focuses on cybersecurity with some really cool uh, case studies such as you might have heard about the, the Bangladeshi uh, central bank uh, heist or the, the, the dark web um, uh, free market uh, place, uh, Silk Road. Uh, and there's a few other, other really cool examples that we'll explore there. Then in module four, we'll look further into artificial intelligence and algorithmic decision making, specifically focusing on uh, accountability, bias, uh, diversity issues, uh, the kind of the challenges or limited chance for recourse or to be able to understand why the AI gave you the the certain uh, decision or outcome uh, that it gave you. Um, and we also have really cool cases there as well. And then in module five, we focus on decentralization and democratization versus uh, centralization, uh, which is really key topic to, on a lot of different levels uh, within both uh, FinTech and the kind of bigger sphere. Um, so we explore the pros and cons in some of these, and we look into who's controlling currency, who's controlling identity, who's controlling um, banking. And then we explore how these roles may be shifting as we go forward and the implications or unintended consequences uh, that might cause. And we're also there exploring the topic in relation to financial inclusion, which is obviously a, a big uh, reason to the, the massive influx on in fintech. Uh, and then in the final module, we are first we're considering whether technology itself, whether it's actually is amoral, whether it's ethically uh, neutral, and then we move on to really explore the the kind of positive cases of uh, fintech and the ones that carry a great promise for the future. Um, and. That is essentially the course in broad strokes. Uh, I probably did not give it justice, but um, I also just wanted to add that I think the course has some, that there's, that anyone can kind of take away something from this course. I think that whether you're a seasoned professional, whether you're a student or anything in between, I think that there, this course will make you kind of stop and think and really reflect upon the, the, the various, um, where we are heading right now or where we are right now and what's going on in the world right now, but also where we're heading. So I hope you all will enroll in the course and I hope that you will enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed being a part of the team creating it. Thank you. And I think John made it sound much more serious than it is. David and David have actually made a key feature, yep, a key feature of this course, um, making it fun. Uh, I think two last things I want to say. The first is a thank you from all of us for not only today but for your support in the context uh, of the online course. The the response almost 40,000 people from every country, literally every country in the world, has been absolutely amazing. So thank you from all of us. The second is a particular thank you to Jen, who was just up here fixing the screen, uh, for basically making all of this happen. And I think in the immortal words of uh, Steve Jobs, one last thing.
my friend SMU to talk about our next course, Blockchain and Fintech. It will be about blockchain technology, blockchain platforms, applications, and limitations. This is a course aimed for layman learners. Learners will be able to understand the fundamental and industrial jargons so that you can interact with key players of the industry. I look forward to seeing you in the blockchain course. The big rise and crash in the Bitcoin market piqued people's interest in blockchain technology. But is Bitcoin equivalent to blockchain? Of course not. Some even think that in the near future, this new technology can change the way we live and the way we do business. In fact, we'll be expecting new business models and new business opportunities. There will even be new ways of exchanging information online. But do you know what blockchain actually is? Take a look at the following questions. Do you know much about this? Do you know what underlying technologies make blockchain secure and powerful? What kind of applications, both financial related or non-financial, are best fit for blockchain? How do these blockchain platforms differ? For example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hyperledger, China Ledger. Is blockchain 100% secure? Can it protect your privacy? If not, what kinds of protections are provided? Why do when somewhere request Bitcoin as payment? Why do people perceive cyber currencies as a means of money laundering? If you want to get more insights, join the blockchain fintech course. And with that, my apologies for running a little bit late, but I'd like to invite you all downstairs uh, for some lunch. And feel free, anytime you have ideas for activities that we can do, please pass those on. And yes, blockchain and dating apps, I'm not sure about this one. <laughs>